Uh, welcome to Rehabilitation Sciences YouTube channel group. And we are here with uh, another session today on the kinematic construction constructs in uh, understanding differential diagnosis of lumbar spine, uh, part one. And we have with us Dr. Sanjay Sarkar, uh, and a senior consultant osteopath. Uh, he'll be talking about that. And we have Dr. Sagun Agrawal. He'll be formally introducing uh, Dr. Sanjay and uh, moderating the session. So over to you, Dr. Uh, Sagun, please. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the rehab. Uh, Dr. Sanjay Sarkar with us. Uh, Dr. Sanjay Sarkar is the first MPT holder from West Bengal. He then went to the USA to complete uh, his MS and PhD through the United States Government's scholarship. He was taught osteopathy by none other than the father of the modern osteopathy, the late Dr. Philip Greenman. He was an assistant professor at Concordia University and visiting professor at Minnesota State University. He was also research scientist for the Mayo Clinic. Now he is back to India and he is with us. He is taking classes on the osteopathy and he is running his clinic in Kolkata. Uh, we welcome you, Dr. Sarkar, on this channel. Thank you for giving us time and sharing your knowledge. Thank you, Dr. Sarkar. All right. Good evening, everyone. Hopefully, you can hear me out. If not, please, um, you know, in the chat box, open the chat box window so that if you have any questions, you can ask that with, to Dr. Agarwal, uh, who is the moderator of today's evening. Um, without further ado, let's uh, get this thing going. Um, today, we'll be talking about low back pain, essentially lumbar spine dysfunction, part one and two. Just so that uh, I know, uh, based on what Dr. Agarwal and I chatted over the past, Last uh, week or so, um, that we uh, the the clientele or in terms of the audience for today is mostly students um, from from the BPT you know um, you know profession. So uh, my talk will be toned down in terms of what I usually teach uh, for professionals and postgraduates. So hopefully you'll be able to follow me through in terms of uh, the anatomy, the biomechanics and uh, the applied uh, portions of biomechanics from um, osteokinematics and arthrokinematics perspective. Um, then certainly you should have questions. And I always tell my participants to have a pen and a paper ready because you need to write. I don't like to spoon feed um, and I would basically tell you a story. The story will flow and then you need to ask me questions at the end of the webinar, which will probably take an hour's worth. Um, and then um, I'm game for, for you to ask me questions and hopefully I can satisfy you with uh, my answers. And secondarily, uh, so lumbar spine dysfunction is a huge topic. It is impossible for us to complete it in two hours. So part one today and Thursday, day after tomorrow, we have part two. But I'll try my best to touch on the tips of the icebergs. And as you know, due to probably global warming, there are multiple icebergs right now floating. And similarly in lumbar spine dysfunction, we do have multiple um, icebergs. So I will try to touch uh, base on a couple of them, maybe three or four tips of the icebergs, just to give you a flavor as to when you are a professional, when you are out in your clinic, or maybe you know is in, the, in a hospital uh, checking out uh, low back pain uh, cases and patients, you have a know-how as to what you need to know in terms of diagnosis and treatment. Um, if you are new to my workshops, um, oh sorry, the webinar, um, you probably would know by the end of the webinar that um, I stress a lot on making you understand the importance and the criticality of how what diagnostic criteria are. I don't believe in treatment without a basis of diagnosis. As uh, Dr. Agarwal so kindly mentioned a brief overview uh, about me earlier that I am actually an academician and a research scientist. That's my goal. That's my, that's my passion. I love to teach, period. Nothing else. So it doesn't mean that I don't do clinics. I, I am in my clinic attire, as you can see. Um, and I am sitting in my clinic. 
Uh, so I obviously do like to um, treat patients, but my focus is not just understanding evidence and reading other studies or articles or journals, but I am a reviewer of three journals from in US as well as I publish. So if you type in my name and add a shoulder in your Google search, you would see my research stuff that I do. I actually do a lot of surgical biomechanics research, meaning shoulder surgery, the, like pre-op, post-op, um, arthroplasty, hemi-arthroplasty, reverse arthroplasty. I do research on that. Um, I have been doing that for the past uh, close to a decade, actually more than a decade, 12 years. So, um, so that's, my, that's my theory, that's my background, that's my principle. And my focus is to make you understand the nuances of how it is important for you to understand diagnosis. That's it. If you know diagnosis, then treatment is not that big of a deal. But if you don't know diagnosis, then it will be a challenge for you because then you will be shooting in the dark. Now, there are a couple of things before I continue. I did say about you having a pen and a paper. You would actually learn a lot. I don't read on through slides. As I said, I'll tell you a story. Slide is for you to guide through. Um, obviously, if you do want the slide at the end of the lecture, there is a contact information page. You can, if you are in your smartphone, you can do a quick uh, screen, a screenshot and have it um, with you. So uh, after the session, you can connect with me at some later point uh, for me to share you the PowerPoint. Now, I would actually take this one minute of time to thank Dr. Agarwal for inviting me to, for this evening to talk on lumbar spine dysfunction and to, the, to his group, including Dr. Harpreet Singh, Dr. Dharam Pandey, for creating such a nice platform on YouTube, the Rehabilitation Science Group that caters to the mind of healthcare professionals and you know, to increase the boundaries and the horizon of knowledge in a positive and a constructive way. So kudos to you guys for doing this. It, it, it is a very, very good job. I mean, I have been, I live in the US and I have been working in the US for the past decade. I know how important it is to use the web and to impart knowledge through that. Now saying that, you know, Dr. Charlie Sharman, if you have not heard her name, you will hear her name later on. Our lab and uh, her lab basically used to collaborate on movement science. And she, I remember she stresses on one fact that as PTs, we are all movement science specialists. What are we? We are movement science specialists. Whatever happens, we always check motion dysfunction, right? You're with me? So even if a patient like with neck pain or locked jaw, TMJ, you know, issues come to the clinic, I tell them to walk, at least walk four or five rounds for me to globally see what's going on. I love to see an individual holistically and my starting point to evaluate any, any uh, problem or issues related to what the patient is coming for is making him or her, her walk for some time. That helps me analyze and understand the, the, the dysfunctions or the cracks or uh, some whatever, you know, uh, nuances and changes in the motion that, go, that, that goes on in, uh, in any kind of dysfunction. Um, so today's topic is on lumbar spine and what we will be doing is essentially um, the learning objectives is basically hopefully at the end of the two webinars that's today and day after tomorrow on Thursday, you'll be able to have a grasp or a hold on the foundational knowledge that you can apply in clinical setting or clinical practice. Compare and contrast causations. I mean, low back pain, what is it? Is it a diagnosis? You answer to yourself if it, this question is a yes or no. So the question is low back pain, is it a diagnosis? You answer to yourself, you don't need to comment. But to me, it's not because pain is symptomatic. It's a symptom, right? Low back is an area. So it just gives me an idea where the location of that symptom is, right? It does not give me an iota of understanding at what actually is going on within the low back. So that's where school of osteopathy comes into play or chiropractic, both are same, both are like, you know, brothers of uh, the same mother, essentially. Um, so like a twin brother, I mean. So 
So uh, both osteopathy and chiropractic, chiropractic science helps us to understand the movement dysfunction. And from there, the fruit is manual therapy. And that's what you as PTs basically will be practicing at some point if you want to become an ortho, ortho practitioner. Um, so that's basically the causations. Then I'll be talking about different diagnostic principles, mostly from the osteopathic schools of thought, actually. Um, describe cluster analysis, decision-making principles, and then hypothesize diagnosis based on outcome measure and CPRs or clinical prediction rules. Um, so this is essentially what I want you to know, and hopefully at the end of the web webinar, you get your queries answered based on what I want you to know, okay? Um, now, what to expect today? So this is essentially uh, the content of a book. So when you open a book, you always go through the content. You want to understand what is inside the book, right? Before actually reading the book chapters. So this is basically today's and also on Thursday's talk as to what we are going to talk about in these two hours. From foundation and knowledge, da 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 da, goes up to clinical prediction rules and certainly the question and answers that you would be having throughout the two hour talk. Um, again, we will be probably focusing today more on anatomy or applied anatomy and clinical biomechanics. And the rest of the hour for Thursday will be on the clinical examination, cluster analysis, and rest of the um, you know, important stuff. I always start a lecture. I mean, webinar in India is pretty new. I can understand that. But I have been doing webinars, I don't know, maybe like six years already. Um, for sure, six years, if not more. In fact, every summer I teach radiology or imaging in, in US and then every, like, you know, that's a hybrid course. Part of it is through webinar. And then the rest is the students basically come to me in the classroom or in campus to learn about the um, all sorts of imaging from basic x-ray to ultrasound of muscles to spec and PET scans also. So that's basically what I teach uh, uh, during summer. Um, so I always start because picture speaks a thousand words. We know that. And this actually brings home a very, very important notion about low back pain. People think low back pain can only happen in older individuals or geriatric and nana, because as you can see, and probably in epidemiology, when we will talk about it can happen to anyone and possibly, possibly there is no theories behind it. Possibly the hypothesis is such that there is something called school bag syndrome. So when you are a kid or an adolescent or when teenage, you basically, you, we all used to carry big, huge backpacks or full of books and you know notepads and stuff and obviously food, right? Um, so that might be the starting point of bad back syndrome. So it could be uh, pain from thoracic spine ribcage down to lumbar spine and maybe affecting the pelvis hip joint and down the chain towards the ankle. So age is should not be a factor for low back pain. And similarly, exercise. My focus is to give exercise that is that has some rationale behind why you are giving what you are giving in terms of exercise prescription. I don't give strengthening exercises in the first phase. My first phase always and period always is motor control. If you do not have motor control of your muscles, no matter what type of exercise and how many exercises you do for strengthening and stretching and flexibility and all the other variables, it will not work. It might work temporarily, but the patient might come back to you, go to a surgeon or go back to any allied healthcare professionals, but that is not how you take care of the of any joint or any, uh, any spinal ailment. So, that back posture in the picture, that exercise of cat, camel, dog, cat, whatever you call that, there are various names for this exercise, improving the spinal mobility is actually incorrect. The picture is actually incorrect. So this could also lead to low back pain. So don't just take and watch YouTube videos and try to get in a habit of, you know, doing exercises or doing treatments just because you see someone doing it. There are so many, you know, various, so very subtle changes and variations that goes on inside that you will not be able to read through in a video. So please be aware those who are, you know, affected by pain or those who are students, 
please always refer to your professor and your faculty members because they are your treasure. They know way more than what YouTube teaches you, okay? So please go and ask them if you like some treatment, always go and ask them and confirm with them as you should be doing that or not, okay? Be judgmental about this. Just because Dr. Sarkar is saying doesn't mean it may not be true. My, the content of this, any anything that I say or read uh, are referenced from the resource pages in the last two slides of today's discussion. So you can refer to any and everything in terms of the content based on the last two pages or slides where you can refer. I don't want to say anything out of my whims and fancy. I want to base my talk based on evidence, research, and nothing else, right? Then only you should be able to believe in certain instances. Okay, all right, so that's essentially the picture. So number one, age should not be a factor. You, if you are in your teenage or your, you know, not, may not be teenage, but young adult, you may have low back pain, or if you are doing incorrect exercise prescription for your patients, they also might have your yeah, low back pain. Now, the, as I said, I, I have a very, my flow of thought is might be a little bit different than what you're used to in India. Um, I always like to share what people think that's myth and what the factual fact is. So myth about low back pain, you always have to sit up straight. Who told you that? No research says that you always have to sit up straight because your back will be strained if you are continuously sitting up straight. It has to be intermittent. Don't just read words, read in between lines, think it through your gray cells. You have to, you know, uh, give some metabolism to your gray cell. Don't, the ear is where you hear but you have to process it in your mind, which is your network or your Google database is actually in here. You have to process it. Just because someone is doing sitting up straight is good, doesn't mean it may be good or it may not be good. If it is good, why it is good is what you have to think. Always think, always ask questions, constructive questions, not criticism based, based on criticism. Why you want to learn more or do more is what you need to know, okay? And then obviously you don't need to lift heavy objects. Why not? Why won't you lift heavy objects? This is our day-to-day -day activities. Okay, there are certain instances probably you won't. In acute sessions, you won't. Post-surgery, you won't. But never, there is nothing called never ever. You can lift heavy objects, but with proper posture, right? So that is where you come into play to treat and to teach, make awareness, educate your clients, your patients as to whatever is right. They should be doing their activities of daily living, their functional status and how they can maintain or you know, prevent spinal issues. Rest, bed rest is always the best. No, no, there are two NASA studies which actually shows that bed rest for a continued period of time can actually, as you know, leads to muscle wasting, like spinal cord injured individuals have atrophy, right? So bed rest is always not the best, but I'm not saying that all bed rests are bad, right? Don't take any word blatantly. There is no black and white yes or no medical signs. There is always a gray area of gray where it is possible, but you have to do these and these things, then it is possible. Otherwise it is not possible. So bed rest is not always the best, but probably for surgery, if it is acute, if the pain is really acute, then certainly you need to lay on the bed. There is a standard cure for most causes of back pain. Not at all. There is no standard cure because each and every one of us are different. And because each one of us are different, the type of treatment, the type of exercise prescription also will be variable. Obviously, the principles remain static or more so static, but the type of exercises and treatment will vary depending on the symptomology of that patient. And then chronic back pain correlates to the level of back damage. That is actually true if it's acute trauma, you know, a, a sudden road traffic accident, having back pain, having this and that, that can lead to, um, you know, back pain, having a good huge amount of correlation. But overall, there is not much of correlation between back pain and back damage. All right. And then reality, what is the fact of life? 
Now, this is important, very important to us. Approximately eight out of 10 will have back pain at some point in their lifetime. That is huge. So 80% of the population at some point in their lifetime will probably go through an episode of pain. That's where you come into play and say that does back pain does not mean two things. You have to have surgery or you have to just sit down at home and bear the pain until it goes away. No, that's where your education awareness is so critically important for the population, for, in, for anywhere you are living in the world to make your clients and patients aware, your community and your society aware that if you have a pain, come and visit you so that you can take care of the back to have that relief for, from pain for a long duration of time. And then obviously, fact number two, three is very, very common. Now, look at what is NIH, fact number four, National Institute of Health, NIH, that Dr. Agarwal said that I got a grant and then went to US, that's actually the grant from National Institute of Health is a federal grant, as you know, it provides money for research in America in healthcare, right? That's the grant that I had received I don't know, close to 15 years back, then I went to US. So NIH recommends lumbar support cushion. So if someone do have back pain, but there are certain other variables, you have to read through the article to actually know the, the design of the cushion, the density of the foam that has been used. There are other variables. If you use, if you ask your patient to use any sort of lumbar cushion that they can find online or wherever from, that could obviously alleviate some of the painful conditions in the first phase of, you know, uh, first phase of treatment, first week or two weeks of treatment. Oh, one more thing. This, that, this picture right over here where I'm hovering the cursor or the arrow, this is for you to read. Go over and see what actually people think and what actually you can do to their um, back pain. So these back facts, you take as to your leisure time, you open up YouTube and go over this. This is actually pretty wonderful. Also, I speak pretty fast and I know that. Um, but if you have any questions, write it down based on the slide or the content so that at the end of the lecture or the talk, you can type it in in the chat box for me to address that query or question. Is that okay? All right, let's go into epidemiology. Um, I love numbers. I never used to like numbers when I started my, um, uh, you know, healthcare profession. But during PhD, I had to go through multiple courses in engineering and also in uh, biostatistics. Now, now I have actually fallen in love with numbers um, and physics also. Um, so epidemiology is those two pictures right at the top corner and the bottom right is for you to go over. They are extremely important for you to know the numbers in terms of which age group might have predisposition for low back pain. Just go over at some point of time, you'll have a better understanding when a patient comes to you with low back pain, what are your thought process going on, okay? And then it is one of the leading cause of disability in men over 45 years. So anyone who is over 45 might have, be predisposed to having low back issues. Second most common, third most frequent, fifth most frequent reasons for hospitalization. There are a lot of stuff that makes you wonder Duh, why don't people come to visit you rather than go for taking meds? Meds might be good for acute pain conditions, but never for chronic, because in acute pain conditions, obviously the pain is so much overwhelming that you need medications, but it does not. Medications do not take care of the movement dysfunctions, right? Because movement dysfunction are structural variances that goes on in you know bits and pieces in facets within vertebral discs within vertebral bodies within transverse processes within spinous processes so that's where you come into play to realign readjust all the soft tissues all the spinous uh, vertebrae so that they are under normal alignment so that's why I'm stressing that you are in one of the best professions and you can create a difference within your patient population. It's just that you need to make your community, your society aware how important it is for them to visit you 
the very first time when the, there is pain of any spinal or any um, extremity um, origin. Doesn't matter, they just should come to you to take care of that pain, right? Now, last point right over here, that last bullet point is actually in green. 92 to 96% of patients experiencing low back pain can be uh, treated successfully without back surgery. That's a huge, huge number. That's a good incidence rate, right? Incidence and prevalence, right? So those are basically, uh, uh, you know, critical criteria to make you us understand the importance of what conservative treatment can do over surgical treatment. Again, don't get me wrong. There, you should know when to refer a patient for back surgery, when not to. If the situation is really critical, they should go in for surgery. If not, then why not give you a shot? So the patient should actually give a shot on conservative treatment first. If that doesn't work, then they can go in for surgery. But you are not supposed, or the patient should not go directly for surgery because someone actually told them to do so. Never, always do a background check as to why you want to do your surgery because of what condition. And now because of Google, you can go in and read through your prob own problem, right? Again, reading through problem is a boon and a bane. It's like a flip side of a coin. It's, there is good factor, there is bad factor of everything. Hopefully the patient reads out the good factor and goes to visit you or comes to visit us to have a better understanding of what the mechanical origin of the derangement is. Now, this is one of a very, very important slide and hopefully you know why. FBSS right over here as, let me move this uh, video right over. FBSS is this guy right over here, which is nothing but failed back surgery, failed back surgery syndrome essentially. So after a back surgery, if the if there the pain persists, if the pain comes back again at a low grade, then what can you do? Go over. You can do PT. You can do chiropractic. You can do spinal decompression therapy. You can do blah blah many other stuff. It is it is imperative for you to know that just because a patient has done surgery and it has failed, I cannot do anything. No. You certainly can do. You work on motor control of the musculature. You, you know, use the creep factor in, from physics to, you know, elast elongate or normalize the collagen tissues or the ligaments and the tendons you can basically do. You can do fascial release. That helps a lot in failed back syndrome, right? Or any low back pain for that matter. Now, I'll take a break and show it, direct your thought process to the left of the screen. The first bullet point and the rest of them has a space. The first bullet point says that success rate for decompression of the spinal surgery is pretty high. 90%, look at the 90% of the patients experiencing good relief of leg pain after surgery. But this um, you know, article has a drawback. It did not say for how long that pain relief was present. The pain relief was good for about, you know, four months, six months, and after that, there was other, you know, um, ailments that took place and the patient actually fought, failed to be have a relief from painful, from chronic conditions. Again, they started to have back pain, hip pain, uh, pelvic dysfunction, thoracic pain. So you take out a, fu a function from one segment, the function from up and down segment will also go, right? So you are aware of that. So that's actually what has happened. Now, look at the rest of the bullet points. Overall, failure rate of lumbar spine surgery was estimated to close to 45%. Nearly half of the spine surgery has failed. Then the next bullet point, 30, 15, and 5% of the patients experienced successful outcome of back surgery after second, third, and fourth surgeries. Voila, it's nothing new right so you need to make your patients understand that the the rate for back surgery failure is actually considerable and i know the, there are really awesome back surgeons who actually do not go in to do back surgery if they are not sure up to 80 to 90 percent that the outcome would be good if the surgeon is not sure uh, in the realm of 80 to 90 percent then why do a surgery if you are not sure, right? 
So those are the surgeons that are key to, you know, help your clients from surgery or from, uh, you know, from pain post-surgery if there are any kind of, you know, uh, derangement dysfunction that is really, really critical and that conservative treatment has actually failed. All right, definition and categories. Now, you can find a bunch and bunch of low back pain definition, but this just caught my eye. Pain that occurs posteriorly in the region between lower rib margin and proximal thigh. I mean, think about it, low back pain, as I said earlier, low back pain to me is never a diagnosis, even though I, you have probably all seen that, even read in books or maybe in some journal articles and probably in uh, anywhere else. But this gives you the location of where that symptom, which is pain, which is subjective, intensity for you and for me will be variable because my experience in pain might be different than an individual who is in the army, Indian army or wherever, uh, in which country, wherever, that army individual will have a higher pain threshold. The, the impact of back pain that will ha have on my life will be extremely and exceedingly different than the same impact or the same pathology and the differences in impact it will have on an army personnel, right? You agree with me, hopefully. So low back pain does not give me an answer as to what is going on, or even give me, does not even give me an iota of understanding as to which direction I should go. I mean, okay, low back pain, so what, essentially, right? So that this actually brings home the point as to, it just gives you the region, and that it gives you an subjective information of pain. That's it. And we all know that there is a something called biopsychosocial aspect in pain. And that is over here. In your mind, in the brain, what are the thought process, the environment, the societal structures, the relationship that you, the client have with his or her family also plays an, a very important part in painful um, experiences. Um, categories obviously are based, as you know, I don't want to go through it, but look at that in the pie chart. Chronic is over 60% of the low back pain conditions, and that's where you should play a hugely important role to ameliorate and reduce the pathology or the sign and symptom that goes on with the chronic LBP. Now, we will be jumping into from, like, you know, statistical area to more philosophical statement of anatomy and biomechanics. Excuse me. Purpose and functions of lumbar spine. Obviously, it's a base of support. It is um, a link for your head and thoracic cage. It links the upper extremity and lower extremity. It protects the spinal cord and improves trunk mobility, right? Now, when we jump from a little bit of very brief overview of you know, what the spinal function is to the kinematics or biomechanics of it. so. Basically, kinematics is motion of the bone. And kinematics comes from the uh, science of kinesiology, or I think in India we say kinesiology. Um, so bone movement without reference to the joints. So essentially, your bone is moving based on a three-dimensional plane outside the body. And I don't want to explain into it. It is all dependent on vector coordinate geometry. And I have to talk to you about a lot of math to understand what XYZ plane means. And when it is called a global XYZ, how it is variable in terms of vertebral XYZ. So there are all many other things that goes on to help you understand the kinematic uh, variances and nuances that can be attributed to, um, you know, translate arthrokinematics and osteokinematics. So we won't be jumping into that. And for that, we obviously need, you know, motion sensor cameras or, you know, accelerometers and gyroscopes, the same thing that you have in your uh, smartphone. Those sensors need to be placed in the body segments to understand bone to bone relative motion and with the global motion. Um, okay, the components. So essentially, a vertebral segment is basically the two adjacent vertebra with a disc in sandwiched in between. Two adjacent vertebra with a disc sandwiched in, in between. That's actually the spinal segment and whatever soft tissues that should include ligaments and others, um, you know, non-contractile and contractile element that helps to move the segment or the bone joint in this case. Now, 
as I said earlier, I love physics. And this, I'll give you a very, very brief one sentence overview as to what I mean by when I say the osteokinematics part. When you are measuring a joint, you measure with a goniometer. And going forward, when I say a goniometer, in US we call that goni, goni in short. When you use a goni, you are actually measuring angular degrees of freedom, flexion extension, abduction adduction, and obviously horizontal rotations, internal or external rotations, right? So three planes of motions. But these planes of motions are in this way. But let's say, for example, when my spine moves, the spine is actually moving out of plane, right? Out of plane. So am I measuring what I should be measuring? There are minimum to minimum three research studies which say that the goniometer error rate, it varies between about six to close to nine or sometimes 10 degrees. So let's say for assumption six, 10 degrees of error with a measurement in the goniometer. So if there is a difference in range of motion by 10 degrees, honestly, I'm not so sure if there is the difference that my treatment has created. So a minimum difference more than 10 degrees is needed if you are using GONI as an outcome measure tool. So go over, search through Web of Science. I love Web of Science more than PubMed actually. Web of Science has more allied healthcare and you know biomechanical stuff, um, uh, papers and research articles in there. I'm, I'm not sure if it's for free, honestly, uh, but uh, to me, it's much better than Pub, uh, PubMed. Um, all right, so that's basically angular degrees of freedom because the body moves at an angle and with the goni, you cannot measure arc in radians. You are measuring degrees in a plane. So that's where the error comes into play. So osteokinematics, just two vertebrae, two vertebra when it meets, they meet with the facet joints, the inferior facet and the superior facet. The superior articular facets, inferior articular facets, you have two segments or you know vertebrae that comes in between the disc. And so essentially you have four interplay. Now, interplay of four facets. Now, probably you have seen videos or you have heard from your faculty members or seniors when they have done any high velocity manual therapy, manual uh, you know, manipulation, you have heard cracks. So essentially it's nitrogen gas because it's usually a you know vacuum and if the gas you know goes in there and stays for some time it and you crack the joint the nitrogen gas sucks and it actually comes as a pop or a crack however you might define but that does not give me any idea as to if the patient really has become better or am I able to reduce the subluxation that was present in the joint? It just does not give me anything because that cracking or the popping is nothing but nitrogen gas and a little bit of nitrogen dioxide is also present. Um, but more so, it gives me only an idea, okay, I did that treatment. So don't be hooked in that I need to have a crack to have a positive outcome, otherwise not. You just go over, look into a bunch of studies, you will note what I'm saying. And this is where the four facets come into play. The facets are so, so small, like peas, you know, the size of peas. Obviously, facet sizes are variable from cervical spine to lumbar spine, but usually, let's say they are about one millimeter in cross section. I am not saying diameter because the cross section varies. So they kind of slide together now. Hold that thought, slide together. When they slide together, this is what actually happens. The superior facet is actually faced posteriorly and medially. So the inferior facet needs to be in line with the superior facet, which is posterior and medial. The inferior facet is lateral as well as anterior like this. So when do you move in flexion, let me show it to you. When I am moving in flexion, the superior goes, slides more anteriorly and slides up. So antero superior or supero anterior motion of the superior facet takes place when you are bending your spine forward, right? So in many cases you have seen, ah, someone is 
extending forward or someone when they extend their back they feel a localized compressive force ah so that could be a huge possibility of facet joint arthropathy where the facet in during flexion is not moving supero anteriorly or while coming back from flexion to extension infero um you know posteriorly or posterior inferiorly like this 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 the flexion extension motion that's where you are trying to do your high velocity to clean up the motion that dysfunction which was which was persisting that's what you are treating with the help of um chiropractic and osteopathic techniques now where does mfr met and other exercise comes into play you do your you know uh, facet joint mobilizations or manip but that does not give that patient that idea or the brain the frontal cortex the idea it should stay that way it will revert back to its original position which was abnormal to prevent abnormal positioning or patterning you have to induce motor control exercises of the low back and that's a completely different uh, you know topic of discussion i can go on and on it will probably take uh, you know i don't know two months or so to have a brief understanding of uh, that the concept first started by shamway cook and marjorie wulakot right so they started the theory or you know the philosophy of what motor control is and from there we have taken the feed forward mechanism for lumbar spine and um, you know try to do motor control exercises for multifeeders rotators and semi spinalis those three are the deepest layer of the spinal musculature or architecture okay so motor control motor control motor control never ever forget etch that etch that or hammer and chisel it in your gray cells so that you never forget the first phase of any exercise prescription should be motor control and nothing else um again we are already close to over 45 minutes there are a lot of things to say over these degrees and angulations but i do everything in my workshop two day workshops in three different levels so um i mean that's basically it for today but next time when we if there is time for you to visit me or like we do our workshop then i'll talk about the angulation and changes and vari variations that goes on within the disc and the vertebral body now this is one of my favorite slides for today's discussion we always i'll actually jump one slide and come back to this one we always have seen okay lumbar motion how much is it let's try to assume you know eyeball how much motion it is is it whatever degrees you know flexion extension side bending rotation it is but that total motion is it found in each and every vertebral segment not at all because in each vertebral segment for example for flexion extension approximately 12 to 15 degrees from L1 to L4 and about 20 degrees odd in between L5 S1 so this total flexion flexion angulation or flexion extension angulation of approximately let's say 90 degrees to 100 degrees is possible by summating each segment vertebral segment you add each vertebral segment motion to come back to this um you know total range of motion slide okay range of motion value for flexion extension side bending rotation for everything all right so that's basically the segmental motions now as you note axial rotation and side bending rom decrease when you go from superior segment to inferior segment very simple why there is a reduction in rotation and side bending from l1 to l4 because the facet joint size increases the vertebral body size increases as a result with the there is diminution or reduction in the range of motion because it becomes more stable more static and more hard for the body and the soft tissues to move it in side bending and axial rotation um and that's the reason you have maximum uh, flexion extension plane motion in the lumbosacral joint as you can note from the 20 degrees compared to 12 to 15 degrees approximate segmental range of motion 
coupled motion so coupled motion probably you have gone, your uh, faculty members have gone through in your first and second year and now that you know that planar motion in human being is impossible if it was possible then we couldn't have done any functional task because you all know functional task is multi planar it cannot follow one single plane as a result the coupled motion within each facet joints are also multi planar they move and slide and trip and then become back up so they are always kind of moving they are moving osteokinematically they are moving arthrokinematically so those motions of flexion extension and rotation or rotation and side bending at least two motions if not three motions happen together okay so that's basically coupled motion so you cannot find one motion purely in a living organism so i do cadaveric study so where i have we do basically do spinal you know um research on dead bodies so there are lots and lots of research from our lab itself to actually figure out what motions happens in which segmental joints and how much of this is actually possible in each facet joints now from osteokinematics right over there to jumping into arthrokinematics arthros is between joint osteo is bone so now we are jumping into joint and between joints it's a gliding motion what are kind of gliding motion it can go appa it can go mediolateral it can go superior inferior so whenever your body is moving whenever your body is moving there will always be the translational mechanics that goes on by slippage by slippage of one facet over the other because it is based on the philosophy of newton's gravitational forces because there will be some amount of gravity and your musculature both contractile and your non contractile element that is trying to pull that pull actually essentially creates a leverage that leverage helps the you know the bone on bone in this case the facet on facet to slide as the body is moving osteokinematically okay now from osteokinematics to little bit of arthrokinematics and now the constraints of ligamental structures basically the non contra the primary non contractile units that we as allied healthcare professionals may not be directly involved or may not be able to directly change the structure but as i said earlier there is a law in physics called creep whereby you can do sustained you know treatment techniques on these long these ligaments to make them change to adapt to the new normal like we all know what new normal is to adapt to the new normal which is the correct posture which is the correct posture you can change their collagen um, elongation collagen linearity there are certain linear coefficient ratios and all um uh, there then you have your um, you know uh, get alpha beta and gamma slides and stuff that actually helps you understand what the coefficient ratio what the twist ratios and all are for each ligaments and stuff so that actually helps down in terms of getting the normal contractile element uh, stability from in both static and dynamic conditions so uh, all anterior longitudinal ligament you have to you be, be, better know what all is anterior longitudinal ligament in front of the vertebral body posterior longitudinal ligament as it says posterior to the vertebral body you have the spinal the spinal cord is actually going down then you have right by in front anterior to the spinous processes anterior to the spinous processes you have your ligamentum flavum and that ligamentum flavum is extremely important and possibly the one of the non contractile unit that has a huge role in dynamic stability we can talk about static and dynamic stability at some later point but for now just know that when you are bending forwards and you are trying to straighten to coming back to neutral so our relative extension i am not talking about extension i am talking from flexion from flexion to coming back to neutral which is essentially a relative extension that's where ligamentum flavum actually helps into 
use that compressive force or recoil it stores energy when you are flexing it stores that energy and there is a rebound phenomena that helps the ligamentum flavum quote unquote you know pull pull is not literally what it how it pulls um, but quote unquote that's why i said quote unquote pull the body with the help of your back extensors to from flexion to normal or neutral position or make the spine more neutrality or neutral spine then you have your interspinous supraspinous and intertransverse ligament which usually are the most developed and the thickest in the uh, lumbar spine area that's why it is extremely challenging for surgeons spinal surgeons to go through in the posterolateral approach and try to decompress the spine because they have to um, cut those some of them do cut those and there are three or four variations of how to cut and where to cut um, they can have to cut these one of these actually ligaments to go in and decompress um there are a lot of other things to say but let's say for now in terms of these ligamental um rehab you cannot as, as i said earlier you cannot and cannot directly treat them but with the help of motor control when your spine becomes neutral they actually have a role to play to maintain neutral spine by um having the collagen tissue and the connective tissue aligned in a proper way all right last couple of slides before we uh, i'll take your questions um now one of my favorite structures for low back pain patient is nothing but thoracolumbar fascia or fascia probably that's how you say so fascia in this case has three the fascia actually has three so i i actually um dissect cadavers actually prosect cadavers not dissect my students do dissect section of cadavers i prosect cadavers and i have been doing this for a long time like prosecting cadavers at least every fall i prosect six cadavers or dead bodies to help under students understand the mechanics of the human body in the applied anatomy course um now is the fascia is so thick there and it is so challenging to separate them from the you know transversus abdominis underneath and the quadratus lumborum that goes on that shows us and it's also an origin for latissimus dorsi look over here where my uh, uh, cursor is hovering look at where the origin of latissimus dorsi or dorsi is from the thoracolumbar fascia so that's why there is a blending of non contractile to contractile tissue the biomechanics of uh, this blending contractile to non contractile tissue that junction is extremely tough to understand there are research done on supraspinatus like where the there is musculotendinous origin of the supraspinatus going and forming a tendon so there are lots of uh, you know uh, uh, rotator cuff injuries that actually happen in this musculotendinous um you know area and i have some research done on that also and you can go to the net and uh, read about it um but this for again for the purposes of today's webinar this guy over here has a huge role to play in static stability and maintaining neutral spine and you probably have done mfr so this is where you should be doing mfr you probably have heard of may not seen iastm tool techniques so iastm is awesome in this area you can do lumbar use uh, you know rolls for lumbar spine that you use for it band stretching you can do that so anything and everything that leads to stretching and extensibility flexibility of the fascia in low back pain is extremely important but please be aware i always believe in something you have to follow the angle of pull and line of action of any goddamn soft tissues right so this soft tissue thoracolumbar fascia is in a v shape like this like this so your treatment techniques should also follow the line of action and angle of pull which is in a v shape otherwise you may be able to get a little bit of outcome but not 100% of the outcome your your treatment will not be perfect if you do not follow the principles of physics the laws of physics that govern human body science and that's what the biomechanics is all about um i am um, and i don't want to go into the origin and it limits and i talked about the last bullet point when it helps in limits flexion and comes back as an extensor torque 
All right, kinetics. There, the kinetics is honestly, if you want to read about biomechanics, the best book from applied sense is by Newman, and I am pretty certain I have it under the resource section. So go back online and figure out where Newman's kinesiology is. That's basically a standard biomechanics book that has been taught in uh, America. And then in terms of understanding PhD level or doctoral level, research level, biomechanics, you have to understand white and Punjabi. But there are a lot of math involved in that. So it might be dry for students at your age, but later on, maybe you might like a little bit of it. So kinetics is just one slide, but obviously it is not. There are a lot of things that go into it. There is muscle modeling that uh, we do based on softwares like Mimics. Um, that we bring in um, kinematic uh, XYZ coordinates and that we bring in CT and MR scans. We combine these two things in the MIMIC software to create um, a three-dimensional osteokinematic model. And from there, we kind of model the muscles that are involved in this, how they can work and work not. So based on those muscle modeling theories and principles, the research suggests that larger vertebrae allow for supporting additional weight. That's why L4, L5 is so huge and stocky, right? So huge and stocky. So, but what you need to know now, since you are very young, you want to just learn, but what do you need to know? During relaxed stance, so I am standing just by my body weight. More than one times my body weight is actually being forced through my lumbar spine. That's actually huge, right? two times my body weight during ambulation. So you have to check the footwear of your client in low back pain because that guy two times, so a, let's say a 70 kilogram individual having low back pain, actually the force that goes through the lumbar spine during simple walking or ambulation, which about 1.8 miles per hour speed, um, that is twice, so 140 kilograms of force that goes in. That is humongous, right? 100 kilograms of dumbbell or barbell, you are basically doing some squats or bench press with and walking. Is it possible? Maybe, may not be. And that's how there is so much of degeneration. So you need to take a look of the footwear and you have probably need to change the client's footwear in terms of how, what type of sole and other, uh, you know, uh, gait mechanics you have to check through in understanding the deviations and patterns. All right, there is a slide next, which I'll talk a very briefly a little bit about mathematics, but here, please understand, shear forces are huge in lumbar spine because lumbar spine, especially L4, L5 are not straight like this. They are at an angle which is anterior and inferior. The anterior edge of the lumbar spine are inferiorly directed, causing a lot of shear forces shear forces that goes on. And obviously the, um, the muscle is always active, the back extensors and all the contractile tissues are always active to keep your spine as straight as possible. So compressive forces, axial compression obviously is absorbed more by the disc and the vertebral body itself. That's an awesome thing. Now, facet joint can carry load between zero to 33%, 0% when you are laying down and as you are forward bending, more and more loading is occurring within the facets at different positions and different regions of the facets. That's why you could probably notice when you check for facet joint arthropathy, the osteophytes actually are on the superior posterior edge of the facet joints, not much in the anterior, in antero inferior edge. That is the reason because the mechanics is such that it creates more abrasion, more um, force, more vectors, um, improper vectors through the facet joints in the supero, in, supero uh, posterior rim to create more osteopathic changes. Um, and then obviously the last bullet point is um, evident. All right, Thus, this guy is for you to read, but just I want to take one moment and um, ask you, L3 disc, not L4, L5, simply L3 for a 70 kg person at 40 degrees of forward bend has 1000 newtons. So let's say if we divide it by 9.8 and uh, 
nine point eight is gravitational, um, you know, force. So we divide the newtons to con uh, convert it into kilograms. Let's say we divide by ten. So hundred kilograms of force is going for a seventy kg individual when you are bending forty degrees. So think about the amount of pressure if the weight of the individual goes up, up, and up. So always make note of the BMI. Of your client or patient coming in with low back pain, extremely important. Um, and then obviously bending loads, risk of failures increase with loading in combined direction. Risk of loading, like I am doing a tilt in the scapular plane, which is between flexion extension plane and abduction adduction plane. In this plane, 45 degree angle, if I do, the risk of failure for the disc is much more. That's one of the reasons, not the only reason, why posterolateral part of the disc is weak and elements come out for, you know, um, this bulge, herniations, bulge, sequestrations, and the light goes on and on. So that's one of the reasons, combined motion problem. All right. Probably my second most favorite slide. I don't want to go through it in, in terms of the vector mechanics, but just to give you a touch of it, touch of flavor on it, the, if you remember from biomechanics, I don't know, probably first year or second year you read, first year you read through, the length of the vector and the thickness of the arrow gives you the direction and the amount of force, right? Length of the arrow is the more the force basically is. And now when you compare the picture from your left to your right, from your left to your right, look at the anterior shear force with, you know, too much lordosis, excessive lordosis, when there is close to obliteration of the spinal foramina leading to, let's say, for example, you know, sciatica. Look at the amount of shear force. It has vastly exponentially increased more in the anterior, could lead to disc problems, disc bulge, herniation, whatever, and also through listhesis, listhesis. So my focus for my low back pain client is to bring their spine, which is for sure like this, to like this, so that I can reduce the anterior shear force, maximize the compressive force, thereby the body weight, which should pass just anterior through, anterior of what? Anterior of the foramina takes place. And now over here, it is, through the foramina, look at that. It is the body weight is through the foramina in through the facets, and that's where the there is failure of the back because the anterior shear force is so high. And if the individual has big belly, weak core muscles, the muscle and reduced intra abdominal pressure will pull everything anteriorly, resulting in failed back or low back pain. Now, this is very okay so in us real people or students rarely study an uh, gray's anatomy people mostly or students mostly go to moore's anatomy moore and i believe i have that uh, book uh, the name of the book listed in there and these two pictures are actually from that uh, uh, you know uh, you know uh, Anyway, from there. So the thing is, what I want you to know is the attachment points. So I, another thing, the origin and the insertion in anatomy is obsolete. People right now don't know if that's the origin, that's the insertion. So the new nomenclature for anatomical sense is attachment points A and B rather than origin and insertion. What, is, what do you mean by origin and insertion? It is very very incorrect way of literally saying that. So we don't say it right now. This picture where I am hovering my cursor right over here is basically gives you a bird's eye view, like a CT scan on an MR scan as to where the musculature is. I love to do motor control for iliocostalis, longissimus, spinalis muscle, the superficial layers of the back muscles. Then I also like to do motor control for these guys right over here, the transversal spinalis, right? Right over here, the rotatoris, the multifidus, and the semispinalis. These three and three, six muscles, if you are able, or not you, but your patient is able to control the firing action potential for them, their back pain will be gone. That's basically it. So you need to know how magically you can treat and make these 
uh, muscles work in the correct pattern, which is based on motor control theory. The motor control center, MCC, is in cerebellum, but the patterning of it goes in the frontal cortex. And there are a lot of theories and postulates uh, based off of that. Um, and again, anterior and posterior, you go through it. It's pretty easy peasy. If you don't understand, you can let me know later on. All right. This is a very common lingo in US called take home message, meaning what did you learn today? We actually talked mostly about osteokinematics and arthrokinematics. So the next thing that we'll do in the, my, on Thursday is go through cluster analysis, differential diagnosis, and all other stuff. So hopefully you'll be with us this coming Thursday to have a good know-how. Um, let me quick take a look. All right, this is the Newman book I was talking about. Hopefully, you should be able to find it out online somehow. I don't know. And that's an awesome book for biomechanics. Um, what else do we have? All right, so you can either do a screenshot of my contact information. If you want to learn more about PhD in America and how you can go, feel free to touch base because um, uh, I can guide you in that way. I obviously, I may not be able to take you but I can guide you in that direction to if you want to learn more, know more and stretch the boundaries of knowledge. So that's my contact information and then open for question and answer. I'll stop sharing my slides so that I can see the chat box. All right. All right, Dr. Agarwal, I, I am ready to take questions. So please feel free to ask me. Yeah, good evening, Dr. Sarkar. Uh, good evening. Yeah, it was a wonderful talk, and I am I'm so happy that you have taken out a lot of myths from our practice. Uh, and as you suggested, I was with a pen and paper, uh, and I think uh, your takeaway messages and my takeaway messages would be slightly different uh, when you talk of a TMJ patient, uh, TMJ, uh, a, a patient with TMJ pain and you ask him to uh, walk four to five rounds uh, to give you a global picture, uh, gives a message. Uh, when, you, when you tell that 90% of the patients won't need surgery, uh, it, it still uh, gives an option. Uh, it, it, still gives a, uh, uh, it still gives a message. Uh, uh, when, when your pie chart is showing that uh, uh, the chronic pain patients uh, are far more than the acute and subacute, so there is a message in that. Uh, and when you say that uh, uh, the ADLs include uh, 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 the lifting and bending, and uh, we should not advise our patients to stop doing that uh, right. many times. Uh, yes, sir. Yes. yes. And and uh, lastly, when you talk of clicks and cracks, uh, are not the treatment, but there is more to the treatment than that. Uh, so there is a muscular control, motor control uh, that has to follow the treatment. And right. we, should, we should not be talking of, uh, see here, here you see the pop and the workshop ends. Uh, so that is not where we end. And lastly, no. for our students, I think a message would be uh, to assess the footwear and BMI yes. in patients with uh, low back pain. So yes. Dr. Sarkar, there were a lot of information that we could gain from your uh, 50 to 60 minutes talk, uh, but there are a few questions. Uh, if you would go permit, ahead. I would like to ask. Yes, please yeah. go ahead. So we teach our students about the degeneration model and the wear and tear aspects to pain. And when you say that age is not a major factor uh, to consider because low back pain is in all age groups. So, uh, so do you disagree to, uh, with the degenerative model and the wear and tear with age? Not at all. But I do agree with the degenerative, uh, you know, model. But I don't agree with the age model. So degeneration can occur any time of the age spectrum. So it can actually start early. And just because someone is old may not start degeneration then, but actually the degeneration occurs over time. When you are, we are talking about time and space continuum, then we have to actually go back into our adult, maybe teenage, and actually check the history as to what actually happened. What caused the postural anomaly, which actually predisposed to the mechanical derangement 
after 40 years, after 30 years, after 60 years, I don't know. But I always stress, not I, but School of Osteopathy always stresses to understand the patient from holistically and the just not holistically meaning not just what is happening presently, but in the past, if something has happened and you try to take that into account in your clinical examination guidelines, which was formulated, um, actually it was, uh, the research was published in 2015. Um, it was uh, coming under, you know, a more clinical aptitude in 2016. And in 2017, insurance in America gave the permission to use it in a clinical setting. So that comes under in clinical examination guideline 2017. So if you search it in Google, I'm pretty certain you can find that. Right. Uh, Dr. Sarkar, uh, yes, you also mentioned about uh, um, the advice that a lot of physiotherapists give to the patients for sitting up straight, uh, mm -hmm. which may not be the best. So, so would you recommend any replacement for that? No, uh, what I said is it's not that you, the individual will not sit straight, but how long should he or she sit straight? And that will be variable. Individual to individual, it will vary. So what I am telling or trying to, you know, um, make it aware for the students is there is not one medication for the same low back pain. Every low back pain is a different sign symptoms has to the, the, the treatment principles need to be customized. It need the exercise prescription need to be tailor made for that specific individual based on his or her goals, aims and what the normal was for him or her, that new normal thing, right. essentially. So it is not incorrect to sit straight, but it's incorrect to say, you just sit straight. The patient will sit straight, but you did not say anything for how long. Okay, my back is aching, I'm still wanting to sit straight. That is harmful. Did, okay. did I get that message? Yes, clear, absolutely, Singh? absolutely. Right, like right. And just, just a couple of questions more, because uh, I was so much into the lecture and uh, Thank you. More than anybody, I, I had my personal doubts. So sure. uh, there was there was another thing uh, that uh, uh, you had a lot of stress, uh, not on the disc, uh, but on the facet. Uh, is it because uh, of your background into osteopathy? Uh, because a lot of presentations of low back pain uh, uh, will stress more than 50% to 60% of the time on the intervertebral disc. Right. So as I said, in a one hour webinar, it is probably impossible for me to touch base. So what I did when I was talking with Dr. Agarwal as actually went through some of the previous webinars. So I wanted to do something different. So I wanted to touch base upon more of facet joints and not okay. of this. Oh. As I said, I am a research scientist. Um, I have was with University of Minnesota. I was with Mayo Clinic and stuff as research collaborator. I do cadaveric studies too for cervical spine and lumbar spine. I do surgical biomechanics. I know how important that is, but I don't think that if I talk about that, right. you know, right. the right. students may not be able to grasp. Right. I change right. the disc and but, put on titanium. But you, would, but, but you would say that they are equally important in low back pain causation. They are equally important, but in chronic conditions, you need to check the facets and then go with the disc rather than vice versa. Okay, okay. Facet and, joint arthropathy in chronic is the first go-to, especially in young adults, IT professionals, and even right. going kids, they will have more facet joints arthropathy. And but if the if it's an indiv older individual having long-standing low back pain, both are equally important okay. and facet joints. So again, it is dependent on age, what the work a work culture through the how the career he or she is doing, many other variables, and you might be knowing. Yeah. So, Equally give importance, but is dependent yes. on what people have already taught in the uh, on the rehab science group. I wanted to do something different. Right, so right. It's a different flavor. Yes. And, right. and lastly, and lastly, uh, not a question, but a request that when you go to part two, uh, uh, please elaborate a little bit more on the ligamentous rehabilitation. Uh, that is something new that we don't do much in India. Oh, I know, I know. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so I, much I, I for my side. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Thank you much. Yes. Can't hear you, Dr. Agarwal. I can't hear you.
Dr. Shagun, we can't hear you. Your voice is not coming, Dr. Shagun. No, we can't. Yes, Dr. Sagun. I think there is some problem with his uh, yeah, internet or something. Uh, something. Uh, but anyway, uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Sarkar. Uh, yes, Dr. Pandit, for thank accepting you. our invitation and uh, people will join the day after tomorrow. For, thanks for All now. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Thank you, Dr. Pandey. And thank you very much, Dr. Agarwal, for inviting me uh, for the first part of the talk. And hopefully your students have enjoyed or at least got something out of it. But uh, again, they, they are, uh, uh, it is available online, so they are free. Uh, they can feel free to touch base with me for any other questions and you also so thank you very much it's a pleasure talking to you thank all right you. bye thank see you, you thursday thank you. thank you bye